we are sir live now okay good morning all of you so now we have another couple of minutes before we can take the today's speaker professor alok thawan who is uh, also a host of this entire program and exactly at 11 o'clock we will start and we have a few more uh, minutes a couple of minutes and that will allow more participants to join from youtube and facebook just now we have started so A very good morning to all of you. Today we have Professor Alok Dhawan, who is one of the very important persons who is involved in conceptualizing this summer research training program and who is working very closely with our team to lead the program from the front. And upon our request, Professor Dhawan, has uh, kindly given his consent with a 24 hour notice to give this lecture. And uh, we are very much looking forward for his lecture. And as a host, he and I are very similar and I don't want to speak further, but for the benefit of a number of students, I request my colleague, Dr. Saurabh Burwa, to introduce Professor Alok Thawar. Now over to Dr. Saurabh Burwa. Good morning, everyone. Honorable Director, CSI Ernest, Professor Gina Hari Sastri. Today's guest of honor, the lecturer, Professor Alok Thawar from IITR Lucknow. It is indeed a privileged moment for me to read out or to introduce Professor Alak Dhawan to all my fellow colleagues and students who are actively participating in summer research training program that has been hosted by CSIR, where your active participation has structured many eminent personalities to deliver, to encourage you all. And Professor Alok Dhawan, being a host, is one of them who has uh, volunteered himself within 24 hours to deliver his lecture. Professor Alok Dhawan is currently Director CSIR Institute of Toxicological Research, Lucknow and Outstanding Professor, Biological Sciences, Academy of Scientific and Innovative Research, ACSIR. He served as a Director, Additional Charge, CSIR Central Drug Research Institute, Lucknow, which we call CDRI Lucknow, from December 2017 to July 2018. He was the founding director, Institute of Life Sciences and Dean Planning and Development, Ahmedabad University, Gujarat. 
He has played an important role in building institutions of excellence in higher education and national laboratories across the country. He obtained his PhD degree in excellence in biochemistry from University of Lucknow, India in 1991 and was awarded Doctor of Science degree by the University of Bradford, United Kingdom in 2017. He has visited several countries both for conducting research as well as to deliver lectures at scientific meetings. Professor Dhawan started the area of nanomaterial toxicology in India and published a guidance document on the safe use of nanomaterials. His group elucidated the mechanism of toxicity of metal oxide nanoparticles in human and bacterial cells. His work has been widely cited. He has set up a state-of-art nanomaterial toxicological facility, uh, which is a unique facility in CSIR IITR. He has also made significant contribution in the area of genetic toxicology. His work in the area of nanomaterial toxicology has won him international accolades as well, and he was awarded two Indo-UK projects under the prestigious UK IERI program. He was also awarded two European Union projects under the FP7 and New Indigo program. As a mission director, he steered CSIR mission mode program on food and consumer safety solutions focus, involving several CSIR institutes to provide technological solutions from farm to fork. Apart from the national reference and referral centers of the FSSI AI, he has been instrumental in establishing Bayrak Bionist and DSIR CRTDH at CSIR IITR to promote entrepreneurship. Professor Dhawan has won several honors and awards, including the INSA Young Scientist Medal in 1994, CSIR Young Scientist Award in 1999, the Sakuntala Amir Chand Prize of ICMR in 2002, Award lecture in the field of toxicology by the National Academy of Sciences India in 2008, the Big Ratna by the Council of Science and Technology UP in 2011, Lucknow University Alumni Association Award 2016, Professor S.S. Katir Endowment Lecture 2019-2020, the Indian Science Congress Association. He founded the Indian Nanoscience Society in 2007. In recognition of his work, he has been elected fellow, the National Academy of Sciences India, fellow, the Ac Academy of Te Toxicological Sciences USA, fellow, the Academy of Environmental Biology, fellow, Academy of Science for Animal Welfare, fellow, Society of Toxicology, founder fellow, Indian Nanoscience Society, fellow, Gujarat Science Academy, Royal Society of Chemistry, National Academy of Medical Sciences, President Society of Toxicology India, and Vice President Environmental Mutigan Society of India. He has, to his credit, more than 150 publications, 20 review book chapters, seven patents, six copyrights, and he has edited nine books. Apart from this, he, ha he has kept one of the feather of CSIR in uh, IITR Lucknow. And in this regard, we are really honored, sir. Uh, and I take this opportunity to invite you to deliver this lecture in, for the August gathering and for our SRTP students. Thank you, sir. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Das, uh, for this rather longish uh, introduction. Uh, and I must uh, congratulate uh, Dr. Shastri and his entire team at NIST who are uh, taking this uh, SRTP program from stride to stride, from strength to strength. And uh, yesterday we had uh, Dr. Rinus Roop give a very uh, 
exciting talks on uh, STI policy and how uh, she's been able to steer the program through DBT. Uh, because she spoke about STI and how it has happened, so I thought I'll just uh, change my talk a little bit. And uh, although I'll be talking about uh, what it has been able to do for uh, the country, but I thought I'll just share a few examples that will give you an idea as to what actually, when we say about STI or investment in science technology innovation, what it actually means. Does it only mean money or does it also mean investing in human resource or creating human resource. So I think that's the pitch I'm going to make. So I'll just take a second and share my slides and then we're good to go. Yeah, so Dr. Shastri, is it visible now? Yes, yes. Wonderful. Uh, so a very good morning to all the students and the mentors who are online. And uh, once again, I wish to thank uh, Dr. Shastri for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts on um, what we envision when we talk about an Atmanirbhar Bharat and uh, essentially meaning that we are looking at a self-sustainable uh, and self-reliant uh, India. And when we talk about a self-reliant or a self-sustaining India, we also talk about in the same stride an India which is uh, confident of itself, which has enough self-confidence and motivation uh, to innovate. Because any country when it moves forward uh, requires a lot of innovation, a lot of uh, science and technology uh, so that the country move forward. And that's how the Western world has been able to uh, fuel innovation. So. And when you talk about Atmir Bharta or you talk about self-reliance, I think the person who comes to your mind uh, at the first instance is, of course, our beloved president, uh, Dr. A.P. Abdul Kalam, who showed the path of self-reliance to this country. In times when we were uh, denied technology, he was the person who actually led from the front. And that's why India is where it is now. I think uh, before I move forward, uh, just on a lighter note, I think uh, during the Corona times, what has borne the brunt is actually the uh, sports arena, and we are unable to see any of the matches going on. Uh, you know, be it uh, cricket or football or you know tennis or anything. So I thought I'll just um, just so that uh, students remember some of these words. BCCI everybody knows because of cricket. But uh, when you talk of an Atmanirbhar Bharat, when you talk of a Bharat which has to become self-reliant or uh, confident, I think what I would say for BCCI is to be critical, creative, and innovative. So I think this is what the students need to remember at all times. Uh, the second that I mentioned is the Kabaddi League, the Indian Kabaddi League. Uh, but here what I mean is the Indian Knowledge League. This is what the students uh, need to create. Uh, knowledge lead for the country and that is what is going to take us forward into the next decade and that's how we are going to become self-reliant and of course the IPL the most coveted uh, IPL that everybody watches on the television so fondly is the intellectual property leader so that's what the audience as of now on the digital platform needs to become intellectual property leaders so I think that's what my message would be to begin with that we need to create an Indian Knowledge League and we have to become intellectual property leaders. Only then our country will become Atmirvar and only then we'll have the self-confidence or, or Atmishwas. Uh, I think before I venture into how uh, we can become Atmirvar or uh, how we can have self-confidence, it is also important for us to understand how we think differently or how we uh, sort of conceive idea differently. So, for example, Council of Scientific and Industrial Research is the name of CSIR, where industry is in the right in the middle. Uh, but at the same breath, I would also like to mention that it is also a citadel of sci scientists for innovative research. So, I think this is what I think about CSIR, and I think it's very important that each of us think of CSIR in a fashion that we are able to contribute to this, not only to the organization, but to the country as a whole. At the same time, um, I was thinking about CSIR and what we uh, sort of inculcate uh, in our 
students or among the faculty or the culture of CSR is to collaborate, cooperate and co-create. I think that is the mantra that CSR always fosters. Uh, not only that, uh, we also believe in uh, a, a sky which is with a difference. So SKY is the normal spelling as we mentioned. Uh, but uh, I keep saying that uh, SKY is what you can see. So if, if your goal is the sky and that's what we say, but in uh, in vernacular, you say pratyaksham kim pramana, meaning that if you can see something, you don't need evidence. So if you can see the sky, you perhaps don't need evidence. But if you spell that sky with a difference, that is science, knowledge, and innovation, S, K, and I, I think that's that will be the road to excellence as far as uh, we are concerned. And that's, again, something that we foster uh, in CSIR. And third, of course, is I stands for innovation. All the time we innovate, innovate, and innovate. And the fourth is risk taking. So that's another advantage that CSIR uh, as uh, an organization, but the country as a whole has been able to do over the several decades uh, post independence is to provide enough risk mitigation, uh, provide enough opportunities for scientists and youngsters to take the risk uh, so that they can uh, take the science and the country forward. Uh, just so that you understand the SNT ecosystem, um, what we were able to show in this slide is that CSIR was among the first organizations to be started even uh, before independence in 1942. And as we move forward, different organizations came to the fore, adding uh, another dimension of uh, science and technology and innovation uh, into the entire ecosystem. And last but not the least, uh, DBT came in in 1986, and you heard a, a fantastic exposition of what DBT is doing by Dr. Renu Chirup uh, just yesterday. Uh, as far as CSIR is concerned, uh, we are a society which is uh, headed by the Honorable Prime Minister of India, who is the president of CSIR. Uh, uh, the vice president of CSIR is the Honorable Minister of Science and Technology and Earth Sciences. And we have 38 labs spread all over the country. And in Lucknow, we have uh, four laboratories, uh, CDRI, which is the Drug Research Institute, CMAP, uh, the Institute of Medic Medicinal and Aromatic Plants, our institute, the Toxicology Institute, and uh, NBRI, the Botanical Research Institute. So that is the length and breadth of CSR institutions across this country. And that is how we are fostering uh, science, technology, and innovation across the board. Uh, if you see this graph, which uh, clearly depicts that the era of, uh, you know, 50s, 30s to 50s was that of individual excellence. Then came uh, the self-reliance, then technology denial uh, driven technologies were developed in our own country. And then we came into an era of IP generation and global competition. And finally, we are looking for global s &T leadership, which is quite apparent and evident from the kind of uh, technologies and publications that are coming out of, of CSIR and other uh, research organizations on this country. And this country has uh, tremendously improved in the quality and quantity of science that is being done, as well as the technology. So we are moving towards a path of, of Adne Parta and self-reliance. At the same time, we are also not losing sight of the global uh, s and leadership. Uh, CSIR, right from the very beginning, if you see, uh, was aligned to the mandates of the country. And right from the very beginning, if you look at the indelible ink uh, that was required for conducting elections, all the way to uh, you know milk powder or the tractor or pesticides or uh, medicines, uh, you know, planes that, that we have developed, uh, so on and so forth. So I think over the period of time, we have shown that CSIR has the capability to nurture science, technology, and innovation and take it forward that, uh, to self-reliance in, in this country. Uh, I think uh, CSIR by and large is divided into these different uh, sciences, physical, chemical, biological, uh, engineering, and information sciences. And due to which we are able to not only galvanize uh, different sciences into solving a problem, but the other advantage being that as I mentioned, we can cooperate, collaborate, and co-create within CSR and, of course, outside of CSR because we have the bandwidth uh, in all the sciences that are there in this country. Uh, more recently, if you look at the uh, 
mitigation strategies for COVID-19, CSIR took the lead uh, very early on uh, because that was the need of the hour at that point in time and the entire CSIR got galvanized into looking at the uh, this challenge and seeing how we will be able to solve these issues that are facing the country and for that CSIR made uh, five uh, sort of verticals, one for rapid and economical testing, the second was for uh, digital and molecular uh, tracing, the third on new drugs, repurposing of drugs, the fourth on hospital assistive devices as well as PPEs, and the fifth was supply chain and logistics support uh, uh, systems. And if you look at this, uh, the logos, you will find that already a CSR was as is true to its uh, name, was working closely with the top industries in the country and we were very fortunate that they have actually uh, bestowed their trust on the quality of uh, technologies coming out of CSR and it was very nice that within a very short span of time CSR was able to uh, deliver on various counts and uh, all the products that have been developed uh, are either in market or in the process and the technologies have been transferred. So that that was a showcase of the strength of CSIR when you talk about science, technology and innovation. So I think it should give uh, the students a great amount of pride that they are associated with CSIR as of now um, in various institutions where they can actually uh, look at the kind of work being done uh, and in particular, of course, interact with their mentors. But I think this showcasing uh, by various, uh, uh, I would say, thought leaders in science that is happening through these lectures, I think it's phenomenal for the students to get an overview of what is happening in these various organizations or institutions. Uh, last year, an India Innovation Index was released and uh, since I'm from Uttar Pradesh, I thought it would be prudent to also mention that um, we stand at number seven in terms of innovation and that's something we need to see how we move up the ladder. Karnataka is number one, Tamil Nadu number two, Maharashtra at number three. So I think again this is something that uh, should give us enough energy and enthusiasm to see how we should move up the ranks and ensure that we, we sort of foster uh, innovation and not only innovation but also entrepreneurship. Uh, coming to my institution which is the Indian Institute of Toxicology Research, I must mention that this is the only institute of toxicology in this country and there are a handful of the uh, toxicology institutes in the world. So it is a very unique institution, uh, that is one. Second, I would say that uh, uh, the very definition, uh, by very definition, toxicology institute uh, is a translational institute. Uh, and the third would be that the toxicology actually defines the domains of safety. Safety per se does not have any domain and toxicology provides uh, a framework by which we can uh, sort of define the domains of safety. Uh, right from the very beginning, the motto has been safety to environment and health and service to industry. So what uh, uh, the need of the hour is that we should all work for the common man and for the industry. This uh, institution has been doing for almost 55 years since inception in 1965. And we have been fostering innovation and uh, uh, good quality science and technology in this regard. Uh, currently, our portfolio uh, is in four verticals. The first, of course, basic applied and translational research in toxicology. And very importantly, uh, the research uh, for policies that we are doing and that permits us to feed into the government uh, policy making bodies uh, what are the requirements for policy. The second uh, is equally important is to assess the safety of various uh, chemicals and uh, that, that are there or drugs and pharmaceuticals and for that we are enabled uh, or certified both by NABL and GLP which is a good laboratory practice. The third uh, is human resource development. Again, a very, very important aspect of uh, investing in, uh, in STI. We need to uh, create a good quality human resource in various uh, areas. And I must mention that uh, I think today is the fifth year of the skill development program run by the government of India. And we are very proud that we also run a lot of skill development programs across the length and breadth of CSIR. 
and so does IITR also run a skill development program. And last but not the least, we also foster linkages between uh, entrepreneurs and industries and of course academia uh, through the Center for Innovation and uh, Translational Research. And this allows them to actually uh, come and work with us uh, and create and co-create uh, things that are important uh, for the bound man. And we we'll share some thoughts on that as well. Uh, these are the Navratnas, as they call, of IITR, and we work in various areas, including food and food, drug, and chemical toxicology, systems toxicology, environmental toxicology, nanomaterial toxicology, computational toxicology, uh, research for policy, and of course, we do service to industry. And all this uh, uh, that we do has uh, translation research at the core. So that's how this institution is. Um, sort of Built. Uh, now, I'll give you some examples of how uh, uh, our uh, the innovative thinking of our scientists has transformed uh, certain areas. One of which was, of course, uh, safe and clean drinking water. Uh, that again, uh, if you look at the CSR portfolio, you'll find right from desalination to portable technologies, everything is available within the CSR fraternity. Uh, several of those are now. Um, uh, commercialized and are in, in public place, public space. Uh, what we thought is uh, look at a, a device that could disinfect because by large water when it is pumped uh, in the municipal supplies is uh, good, but we need to disinfect these, uh, this water when it comes to the tap. And so for that we developed uh, a device which was membrane free and chemical free and uh, what we were able to do is to disinfect water um, uh, within no time if i would use that word uh, and both a household model and a community model were built and both can run on uh, solar power so so that was the thought that when we interacted with the stakeholders and what they want uh, the main concern was that once we put up uh, uh, sort of plant at home or a water purifier at home. There are a lot of consumables that are required, and every year we have to pay a hefty amount of money uh, for the ANC. So now the companies who have taken the technology, uh, at least for the community uh, one, they are promising 10 year uh, sort of uh, you know, warranty as well as uh, they are saying that you know you, you don't need to worry about the uh, maintenance because it is. Uh, IoT enabled device and it can inform you uh, as to whether something is going wrong or wrong or not. So with this, we were able to develop, as I mentioned, the community system uh, device, which is 450 liters of water per hour. And uh, I'm very happy that this has now gone out uh, into the market and and the our technology partners are actually supplying it. Uh, this was something which was very uh, innovative in that sense that uh, we could provide uh, clean, I would say, disinfected water, primarily because uh, the waterborne infections are very high in the villages as well as elsewhere. So we thought it would be a good idea to uh, look at this. So I think uh, this was very well received uh, by the policymakers as well as by the uh, public. As I mentioned, uh, we have now been able to transfer it to two uh, entrepreneurs, one of them being a startup. Uh, and the startup is from uh, Lucknow itself. And uh, we are able to sort of not only empower the startups, uh, as I mentioned, if you talk about science, technology, innovation, and Atmeba Bharat, we need to ensure that the startups are empowered. We need to ensure that the uh, the scientists who are doing the work uh, also get motivated because they can see the technology going out to the market. Uh, another technology transfer was done uh, by the Honorable Minister himself in Delhi, and both these companies uh, uh, have now been able to uh, make the commercial prototypes, uh, and they are now uh, available for public to purchase. As far as the uh, as, as an institution, you must be aware that we, we were also looking for what we can contribute when the uh, COVID-19 situation arose. And so therefore, in alignment with CSIR's uh, five verticals, we started looking at what all we can uh, contribute to the national cause. 
and I'm happy to inform the House that we are not only looking at the sequencing of the virus as part of the CSR consortium, uh, but we've also created a rapid and economical uh, uh, test facility at IITR for testing COVID through uh, RT-PCR. And uh, just this week, we completed 20,000 tests uh, for the patients, uh, the samples of whom we get from the uh, state government. Uh, in the other vertical, we are also looking at repurposing of drugs. Again, the scientists in computational toxicology are working in this area to look at how uh, we are able to repurpose uh, the drug, but also reduce the toxicity, looking at structures and trying to help uh, other institutions among CSIR to uh, develop the drugs. When uh, this Corona or COVID uh, started, uh, the first call that came to us from the government was for uh, sanitizers, uh, whether we can help the government uh, provide sanitizers. And, and this is what our scientists again stood up to the uh, 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 challenge. And within a day or so, we were able to provide a substantial amount of sanitizer and sanitizer to the government so that they could open their shops and start uh, the work normally. This was when the first lockdowns uh, happened. And subsequently, we've been uh, offering this to the government on, on uh, various occasions uh, to the various uh, people who are in the forefront. And I would say uh, when you invest in science, technology, innovation, you are, you are investing in knowledge for the future. And I think these institutions of excellence and eminence that have been created have stood uh, the test of time and has also uh, stood up to the national crisis of COVID-19 wherever they were in, in the country. Uh, and uh, I'm very glad that again, a startup came to us and they actually wanted to uh, start manufacturing the hand sanitizer, uh, which they did. Uh, and again, uh, this whatever uh, we were able to sort of have was transferred to a company and now they are actually manufacturing and selling it themselves. The third, uh, this again is, in, is a good example of how uh, we work jointly and uh, co-create system. So there was a startup working with us earlier on and they had a microwave device which can disinfect a biomedical waste. But they came to our institute uh, to work with us to see uh, what other applications can be built uh, or inbuilt into this device. Uh, and that point in time, we had looked at how we can uh, disinfect linen in the, uh, in the hospitals, especially in ICUs. Uh, where there are people who are uh, infected by various diseases. So we looked at the linen disinfection. And when uh, COVID-19 came in, uh, again, that startup approached us and said, we'd like to see how we can convert that linen cycle or other cycles into disinfection of PPEs. And ultimately, they were able to uh, come up with a cycle that can disinfect using microwave, the PPEs and N95 masks. So now, uh, currently, we have been able to uh, undertake the experiments and the results uh, have been shared with the government so that they can take a call uh, so that they can use it. And this was again something that was very well received uh, uh, by our uh, government. Both uh, the Honorable Minister tweeted it as well as uh, it was up on the month Baat updates. Uh, our Twitter handle used for uh, by the Honorable Prime Minister, where the, the new things that come out uh, and which are contemporary are also uh, highlighted. So again, it shows that if uh, you're sort of creative enough and you're innovative enough, we can do wonders. And this was all an effort towards ensuring that we do not have to import things. Even if you look at the um, uh, APIs, uh, there were a lot of things that, that we had to import all the time, but uh, our CSR Institute uh, sort of stood up and they were able to develop processes that can now be, uh, that are able to indigenize the production of APIs, uh, the active pharmaceutical ingredients. That has helped uh, our pharma sector in a big way. And the fifth vertical was the supply chain and logistic support system. So when you are uh, uh, developing uh, devices, etc. When you're doing tests, 
you need to understand as to what will be the uh, supply chain, where are the things available. And initially, as you might be recalling, there were a lot of issues in uh, procurement. Uh, so that's where CSIR again chipped in and they developed a portal for supply chain management and logistical support. And uh, uh, IITR uh, is one of the nodal uh, sort of institutions for the North. Uh, and we are again participating in this uh, program of supply chain management. So all the five verticals our institute is participating. So when I say that we should invest in STI, I think these are times of crisis for the country. And whenever uh, such times arrive, I think the scientific institutions should stand up and ensure that uh, whatever it takes to uh, sort of, uh, mitigate this problem that should be done at, at the topmost priority and which CSR has shown uh, that it was able to do uh, in a very short span of time. So I think uh, my heart is compliments to all the scientists, the students, the technical staff uh, of CSR and of course the leadership of CSR that stood to the test of time. Uh, now I'll share a small story uh, with the students so that it gives you an idea as to how uh, when you're faced with a challenge, you need to sort of stand up to it. You need to ensure that you have a positive uh, thought process and how uh, I should say in a sense that we are fortunate that uh, over the decades, people have ensured that uh, the science, technology and innovation paradigm has been supported to the hilt, if I may use that word. Uh, in this country. So this is a small story that I'll share with you. This was 2005. I was in Michigan State University and the two gentlemen that you see uh, uh, here are from the uh, chemical engineering group, uh, uh, Professor Hasham and Professor Tarabara. And it was a very cold winter day when we had a meeting uh, that was perhaps on a Friday. Uh, and they asked me that, you know, those days they were uh, synthesizing nanoparticles, especially fullerenes in the in their department, and they wanted to see what is the toxicity of these fullerenes. And I must mention here that uh, at that point in time, although our country had begun uh, synthesis of nanoparticles, uh, colloidal particles were being done even earlier, uh, but the toxicity or safety assessment was not there in the country. So the first thing, uh, as a toxicologist, I spoke to them and I said, well, uh, can I come back to you on Monday and we'll discuss because I also wanted to understand how to undertake this toxicity. And I think uh, at every point in time, we should be open to learning. I think that's a very important facet of the STI policy that if you don't uh, reinvent your, I mean, uh, keep learning and you don't sort of change with time, it will be very difficult even if we put in a lot of money. So I think money, of course, is one part that we keep investing, but I think at the same time it is uh, incumbent on the scientists to ensure that we keep uh, doing things uh, which are new, novel, but at the same time uh, keep track of timelines. And what happened uh, next was that I actually wrote to the then director of my institute uh, asking him for permission that I could do some toxicity studies. And this is again something that I, I never um, stop admiring that I wrote a long lengthy email telling him about uh, you know the importance of uh, the nanotechnology that is coming up and how toxicology will play a major role in the technology coming to the fore and if you look at his response it just says uh, please go ahead I think that is the spirit with which this country is going to become Atmirbar and that is the spirit that we see in today's days and times when people are supported uh, even at the grassroots level by various organizations, by various government schemes that we are able to, uh, you know, uplift the people even from the grassroots, uh, even from the villages. And they have, at least from CSR point of view, I can share with you that CSR ran a, a program through which we were able to capture uh, uh, sort of innovators from rural backgrounds and they went all the way to the CSI Foundation Day last year where the Honorable President actually gave away the awards to them. So I think I think this is how we will be able to uh, foster innovation and in science technology and make uh, this Bharat uh, full of Atma Vishwas, self-confidence and self-reliance. 
So as in, as soon as I got this uh, reply from the director, I put my head down. We did some studies, and I'm very happy to say that please see the timeline. We are 2006. We had a publication out. Perhaps the most uh, highly cited article for these two gentlemen whom I showed. But at the same time, uh, it was another area uh, that I was getting into, which was nanotoxicology. And not only that, it's a very, very highly interdisciplinary area. So as soon as you start investing in STI, you also have to ensure that uh, at each step, uh, we are able to uh, rope in people who will be important for taking that innovation or that uh, sort of technology forward. It doesn't matter for which uh, field of science they come in. So I think this was a, a brilliant example in, in almost uh, 15 years ago um, of a collaboration between uh, environmental engineers or chemical engineers and, uh, and toxicologists to, to sort of uh, resolve an issue uh, that was pertaining to the colloidal dispersion of C60 fullerenes. Um, as far as nanotechnology is concerned, you are all aware that it is an enabling technology. And the issue for toxicology was that um, on the one side you see uh, nanoparticles which are almost one nanometer in diameter. On the other side you see a DNA which is two to twelve nanometer in diameter. So I think apart from the chemical uh, interaction, they can actually physically interact uh, with DNA and, and other uh, macromolecules within the cell. So I think that was the sort of uh, uh, concern globally uh, that was there. So with that in mind, we started looking at how we should assess the nanotoxicology in this country. And uh, again, to simplify the issue, uh, if you look at a sphere, or uh, if I may use the, the vernacular again, uh, if you look at a Bundi laddu and you take out the Bundi separately, so instead of one surface area, you get a huge expansion of the surface area. So when the surface area increases, the reactivity also increases. And as you go down the size, the uh, uh, sort of molecules at the surface increase. So that's how. Uh, nanotechnology, uh, when you break down the particles from a normal size to nanoparticle size, at times they create uh, toxicity uh, or safety issues. So these were things that we highlighted at that point in time, and we moved forward the various issues that were pertaining to the uh, toxicity of these materials, and each of them were uh, sort of uh, addressed at the institution, along with collaborations from IITs and other CSIR institutions. Uh, and we looked at uh, the various uh, approaches, could it be in vitro or, or in vivo or in silico. All of these approaches were looked at uh, to ensure that whatever we are doing uh, can be done in a time frame and uh, the outcome should be uh, uh, good enough so that uh, the world can uh, take cognizance of the fact that whatever we are doing or the data that is being produced can be utilized. So the first thing, of course, uh, when you talk of science, technology, innovation is to look at what are the um, tools at hand. So, of course, uh, you may be aware of the electron microscope, uh, which can be used uh, for uh, looking at the nanoparticles, but it is very, very cumbersome to prepare a sample and look at the, the nanoparticles and, of course, the cells, etc. So we thought, is it possible that we can use a flow cytometer, which is a much simpler device? And the amount of cells that can be seen are, are in several, uh, you know, hundreds of thousand. And is it possible that we can look at whether uh, the, uh, the, the nanoparticles that are getting inside the cells can be monitored? So what we actually did based on the principles uh, that when you get nanoparticles inside the cell, uh, the side scatter will get increased. If they are stuck outside the cell, the forward and side scatter both will increase. So these were the basic principles of um, the flow cytometer. And so using those principles, we first look at the uh, the uptake using uh, electron microscopy, and you can see uh, these black dots, which are uh, essentially the titanium dioxide nanoparticles inside the Fg2 cells using electron microscopy. But at the same time, we looked at these cells and whether we can monitor these uptake of nanoparticles using flow cytometer. And we found that it was uh, quite good um, in terms of monitoring the uptake of nanoparticles in, in human cells. 
Uh, similarly, in bacteria, and, and here I'd like to draw the attention, especially of the uh, students. Uh, this was a fantastic observation that one of my students actually made that while these uh, bacteria was dividing, you still have nanoparticles inside them. So the student said that is it possible that we can actually look at various generations of bacteria and, and see whether the nanoparticles are still there or not. And again, we looked at first the internalization. Now you can imagine the size of bacteria and then the size of nanoparticles going inside it. So first, of course, we looked at the electron microscope and then flow cytometry. And we were able to show that uh, uh, this method of flow cytometry is very good to see whether the nanoparticles, especially metallic nanoparticles, can actually be monitored uh, or the uptake can be monitored in bacteria. And then we looked at the uh, multi-generation study and up to third generation, uh, we could actually undertake these studies and find nanoparticles are still uh, inside after the first uh, sort of exposure. And of course, then we took on to our uh, in silico approach, which again, I feel uh, these are some examples that I'm showing you. Um, again, uh, we looked at the graphene oxide um, and a alpha alkyl protein. So you see the hydrated systems where the protein is able to survive. Uh, on the other side, we took uh, graphene um, and the protein over a period of time actually lost its uh, alpha helical uh, structure. So this was a biology problem. Um, used uh, we used computer sciences to solve it and it was published in a chemistry journal so i think again uh, goes to show that uh, uh, your innovative thought process uh, and the fact that you're able to understand the mechanisms uh, what are the tools is very important to solve problems uh, because of which we are able to actually come up with uh, various facets of uh, engineered nanomaterials right from synthesis all the way up to prediction and toxicity at this institution and we now have a national nanotoxicology uh, sort of facility uh, which has been uh, provided to us by CSIR. Now when you talk of this kind of work uh, I always feel that it is important to see what impact it makes globally so this was the publication we made on the damaging DNA damaging potential of zinc oxide nanoparticles in human epidermal cells. Um, the timelines were that we, it was available online in January of 2009. In April of 2009, uh, the Science for Environment Policy of the European Commission had picked up this paper and they actually uh, uh, wrote about this paper a full page where they mentioned that these kind of studies are needed to ensure whether we can use nanoparticles in cosmetics or not. And currently we are uh, having more than 580 citations for this paper and it's one of the most uh, cited articles of the journal. So I think uh, in the country itself, we have enough uh, uh, scientific grit and determination and, and, and the uh, capability of students that they can actually perform studies that are globally relevant. And not only that, the flow cytometry method, which I described to you in, in the nanoparticle uptake of in bacteria, uh, became one of the highlighted articles in the uh, cytometry A journal, which is to do with novel methods. So again, if you think differently and you are innovative in your approach, uh, this is the name of the student, Kumar. Uh, now, essentially, he has a, a method in his name forever. So I think, again, these are things that students should remember. Don't take an easy route out. Try to uh, spend some time, uh, you know, solve a, a problem uh, with innovation. Right? And the third was, of course, the Langley paper that I mentioned to you. And uh, I'll just share some more slides and then I'll perhaps close for question and answer. Uh, but here are the timelines. We, as I mentioned, uh, the first thing that I had done in November was to shoot out an email to my director in 2005. When I came back in February, we started establishing the facility in 2006. We had then submitted by December 2006 a project uh, with NCL Pune, which is again a CSR lab. Established the Nanoscience Society in 2007. We did an international meeting in 2008. Uh, then we, in the meantime, we had got the UKRI projects, uh, two in, in succession. We had a European Union project with eight countries and this was remarkable because we were uh, sort of teaching those countries how to perform nanotoxicology and they actually came here and got trained and went back. 
uh, CSIR also started a program on uh, on this uh, safety of nanomaterials. We, we were also pro, uh, you know awarded a FP7 project nano valid. This was one of the flagship projects of of European Commission in which uh, 18 to 19 countries actually participated. We did another symposium in 2011 uh, where 15 countries participated. All this was being done so that we can uh, generate enough human resource and try to understand what is the best in the world in this area. Uh, we published a guidance document on the safe use of nanomaterials in 2011, 2016 and advanced imaging facility was inaugurated by the Honorable uh, Minister for Science and Technology, Dr. Harshwardhan. And in 2017, when we looked at the web of science, uh, CSIR was globally positioned among the top five in nanomaterial toxicology. And uh, later on, I would say that uh, in succession, um, our scientists have uh, published three edited books in 2017, 18 and 19 on the various facets of uh, nanotoxicology and, and their interaction through the Ross Society Chemistry as well as the uh, CRC Press. Uh, this is the uh, guidance document that we published. So whatever you do, we should ensure that if it has a larger interest in terms of the policy makers, we should share it with following policy makers. And once this uh, came out, then the DST came out with a policy in which the Institute uh, participated uh, on the guidelines of best practice of safe handling. Uh, more recently, in 2019, the European Commission actually has cited some of our references in the guidance for safety assessment on nanomaterials in cosmetics, as I mentioned to you earlier. But this is a, a document that has come out in 2019. Uh, the Honorable Minister for Science Technology actually released a, a guidelines for evaluation of nanopharmaceuticals in the country. Again, our institute has been uh, uh, closely associated with the formulation of these guidelines. And it is a, indeed a very proud moment for all of us that now the country has a guidelines for evaluation of nanopharmaceuticals. Nano again, it will fuel the innovation uh, cycle among the pharma, pharma sector so that they can bring out a new um, and improved pharmaceuticals in the, in the country. Uh, not only that, uh, just uh, uh, on the July 7th, uh, Again, this was a guideline that was published um, and uh, released by the Honorable Minister on the evaluation of nano-based agri-input and food products. Again, our institute has been instrumental in providing the inputs to these guidelines. And uh, this was this is just a snapshot to show you how we have trained uh, the uh, faculty and students from eight different European countries uh, and they went back and established their uh, in their own countries nanotoxicology. So in, in a sense, we were able to uh, train manpower for the European countries and they've actually benefited from the investment that was made uh, in this area by the government uh, of India. As I mentioned to you, CSIR is positioned among top five in the world in three areas of toxicology, industrial toxicology, food and nano. So I think uh, the investments that have been made um, are, are, I would say, uh, they have provided fruit now. And it is very heartening to see that uh, we are benchmarking ourselves to the global uh, global standard now. Uh, when you come to uh, sort of looking at the investing investment in science, technology and innovation, I think that is the only uh, way we can take the country to self-reliance. That's the only way we can uh, take the country to the top uh, of all the countries that are there in the world. But at the same time, we should ensure that there are policies that will feed into the to the STI policy to ensure that all the stakeholders are able to benefit. And we should not lose sight of the goal that we need to achieve. That's very important, especially for the students. That when you uh, when you have a goal in mind, I think nothing else should bother you. Just hard work. Uh, needs to be done to achieve that goal. Uh, again, for the students, I must mention that uh, when you are into science, you need to have an eye for observation. So the same sample can tell you different things depending on the in-depth observation that you make for the sample. And here is a case in point where I'm looking at a, a photo of the child. But at the same time, if you are doing an in-depth uh, sort of examination, you can actually see the person who clicked the photo inside the 
eye of the child. So I think it depends on the in-depth observation that you make. Another example is here where, where you have two birds. One is sitting here. The other one here is pretty weird, to be honest. Uh, so you magnify it and you still find it is very difficult to identify the bird uh, here. But when you make a close observation, you'll find it's actually the crow with the beak here and the feather here and a ray of light coming through from the feather. So it depends on how you perceive things, how you observe them, what you make out of it, what are the inferences you draw, and how you take the next steps in, in your uh, sort of, uh, plan of action or the way you have to go. I think it's very important for all of us to keep that in sight. I have been indeed very fortunate. Um, the work that I did for nanotoxicology also invited me to begin the uh, uh, TEDx Lucknow chapter where I was invited to give a talk on how the sort of investment or the risk that was taken by the then head of the institution has resulted in the fact that CSR now enjoys the topmost place in the world uh, among the top five people in the world in, in terms of nanotoxicology. So I, I once again, I must say that I have been very fortunate uh, that uh, CSIR has supported the initiatives or the uh, sort of programs that, that have been uh, initiated by me. And not only that, I would say uh, the government has always been very clear in its mind that even if you look at Jai Jawan, Jai Kisan, Jai Vigyan, Jai Nusandhan, at every point in time, uh, science, technology and innovation has been at the fore, even when you talk of Jai Jawan. Of course, we salute our uh, uh, our armed forces, but to keep them up at the border, there's a lot of science behind it. Again, we are also saluting the science that permits these Jawans to be at the border and be safe. You talk of the Kisan, again, a lot of science goes into it, a lot of innovation goes into the farming sector, uh, CSR has contributed tremendously in this area. And again, we salute the farmers at the same time, we ensure that the science behind these people are uh, the best quality that is available in the world. And of course, successive prime ministers uh, added Jai Vigyan and Jai Nusandhan to it. And we are really proud that the science, technology, innovation is taking the forefront in this uh, country. And um, all the scientific community is uh, being looked upon with great reverence and of course with great hope that we can provide the uh, solutions to the problems. This tree is the tree of our institution where we look at not only uh, different programs, but we are also fortunate to have the first uh, bionist of BIRAC uh, in CSIR, but also a CRTDH from the Department of Scientific Industrial Research and the Food Reference Center and the Reference Center of FSCI. So this again fosters the innovation, uh, fosters uh, technology development under the technology development and innovation center, which is being developed at the institution under the CSR umbrella. And I must once again uh, thank uh, my dear friend uh, Shastri for giving me this opportunity to share some things about what STI has been able to do uh, in terms of CSIR, uh, in terms of this institution and how uh, it was able to foster uh, linkages not only within the country but abroad and ensure that we get the best of uh, the STI in this country. I think uh, this is the only way forward for our uh, country if it has to become Atnirbar or self-reliant and I urge all the students to ensure that uh, you should be encouraged and you should take the leap of faith to come into science technology, come into research. And that's how our country will become self-reliant and you'll take pride in saying that you don't have to go to a foreign country to do uh, the science that you wish to do and you can do it right here in this country in one of the national labs or the universities or the IITs anywhere. So thank you very much indeed. And uh, I'll be happy to take any questions that are there. Thank you very much, Thank you very much, much for and, uh, I request our people to take forward the question answers. Uh, lucky Saikya and uh, the others will take over. It's a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Lucky, you please take over. Yeah, yes, sure, sir. Uh, 
thank you, sir. Actually, there are a lot of questions, and we are getting a lot of uh, appreciative messages regarding your talk. And uh, we have with us our, uh, our students, uh, Ms. Lisha, Kalita, and Monty. So yeah, now they will uh, ask the uh, selected questions because uh, there are a lot of questions. And uh, as such, uh, I hope uh, you will like to answer all those things. So now over to Lisa. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, so, sir, the first question is from me here. He is asking how can we use the nanotechnology for the drug delivery and what will be the challenges of these in future? So, Mayor, uh, very good question, I must say. I think a lot of work is being done within the Institute uh, uh, of CS and various institutions are working on this. They're using different uh, nanoparticles as a carrier for a drug. At the same time, they're also trying to uh, look at the possibility of using the drug and essentially making it nano size so that it can be uh, delivered to a particular uh, organ. Uh, two aspects of that. One, of course, is to reduce the toxicity and take it all the way up to the uh, organ that uh, that desires it so you can reduce the uh, amount of drug that is to be given and the second is to reduce the toxicity uh, aspect especially in the cases of cancer um, so i think uh, nanotoxic or, or nanotechnology is being used uh, extensively not only within csr but also in other institutions uh, both in india and globally to uh, undertake the challenge here is to see because the nanoparticles actually cross various barriers uh, such as the blood placental barrier or the blood brain barrier. So the challenge is to see that the, the uh, nanoparticle that you're making for drug delivery uh, or the agent that you're going to use for drug delivery uh, is safe enough and, and uh, uh, either does not cross the blood brain or blood uh, placental barrier and if it does, I think it should be absolutely safe uh, to, to the brain or to the uh, baby. I think these are the challenges that we are facing as well. So there are drugs that are already available in the in the nano sized format. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is from Tanu Atriwal. She is asking, is there any way we can use nanotoxicology in leaching out bioplastics? Can this method be utilized in degradation of other biodegradable materials? So let me first uh, clarify, Tanu, that nanotoxicology is a discipline which assesses the safety. Okay, Once you assess the safety, then you look at how you can develop a method to either uh, degrade the plastic or to uh, you know look at microplastics. It is a way, it is a tool that you get to sort of look at how you can degrade the microplastic. We are doing a lot of work um, on pesticide degradation. We have been able to identify um, microbes that can degrade pesticides and that can degrade polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. We are still working on some of these uh, aspects in terms of microplastics. We have not uh, been able to get a particular microbe that can actually degrade microplastics. Uh, but nanotoxicology per se, if you ask me, that is a, a field that allows you to assess safety on nanoparticles. Uh, and based on that, you can decide the next course of action. I think that's all it is. Yeah, over to you. Uh, thank you, sir. The next question is from Suman Joshi. It is, uh, he's asking uh, enormous rituals globally on nanoparticles and their applications are going on. Okay. And you were talking about toxic, toxicology of nanoparticles. So how are you dealing with toxicity of uh, nanoparticles? Yes, I think again a good question. And that's why I sort of thought it would be a good idea to share with you uh, how these particles become toxic and what are the principles. And when I say toxic, it doesn't mean everything is harmful. We also provide you a range within which the particles are considered safe or they are safe to use. And beyond that range, it will become toxic. So I think every uh, material or every chemical that is being used 
there is certain dose a certain concentration at which it can be used safely beyond which it becomes toxic so that is what uh, nanotoxicology allows you to do it allows you to figure out whether is the concentration or the particle uh, while retaining its efficacy while retaining the um, application that it is meant for can be safely used or not i think that's that's the whole uh, point that i was trying to drive there is no way that i am saying that don't do nanotechnology because it's going to be toxic no everything in this in this world that you deal with at some concentration or the other is harmful okay what i'm trying to say is that based on these principles we are able to develop a safe to use material and and essentially ensure that you still have the efficacy uh, for the application that you want to Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is from Pooja Patel. She is asking, how can we make membranes using nanotechnology for all types of wastewater? Oh, then, um, well, uh, what I think is, Dr. Uh, Shastri is still on online. Dr. Shastri not online. Okay. So what people are actually doing are trying to see if they can impregnate the membranes with uh, different types of nanoparticles that are specific for a particular contaminant uh, that can be removed. That will improve the quality of membrane if it is impregnated and also improve the uh, quality of removal. Uh, so membrane can last longer and it can also be uh, utilized. So that's how people are utilizing the uh, nanoparticles. The other way they are utilizing nanoparticles for removal of contaminants is by taking nanoparticles, putting them in a cartridge and trying to uh, push through the, the contaminated water or whatever they want here. Uh, and that's one of the technologies that has actually come into drinking water as well, where people are using cartridges, uh, using materials which are nano sized. They are uh, part of that cartridge which allows them to sort of take care of the pesticides and other other contaminants that are there in water. Yeah, over to you. Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, so the next question is from Tanuja. Uh, are the guidelines for nanotoxicology is being followed in the area of cosmetics? How one can ensure of it? So I think the the guide whether they are being followed or not is the question for the company who is manufacturing, right? So I think uh, there are regulatory bodies who actually look into these aspects while they're granting licenses. And uh, they, that is why we came up with the nanopharmaceutical guideline as well. So that now if the people have to develop any nanopharmaceutical, they can do so with these guidelines in place so that the regulation of the nanoparticle use can also be uh, done. Same is true for uh, the nanoparticles in the cosmetics, uh, the regulator will actually ensure that they are being complied for. Uh, I think that that should answer uh, her question. Uh, thank you, sir. The next question is from Shivali uh, Sharma. She is asking, can we use nanoparticles uh, to make spray for food safety? Uh, so it depends on the, as of now, uh, we are not uh, sort of, uh, encouraging people to make sprays for food safety using nanoparticles. It will depend on the particle that you want to make. Uh, we have to look at its safety. We have to look at the risk involved, both in manufacturing as well as in spraying them. Uh, it depends on the particle. If it is a totally biodegradable particle uh, that is going to provide safety to the food, uh, we'll have 
we'll have to look at the safety aspects and only then it will be permitted by um, FSSAI to, to be taken forward. Uh, thank you, sir. The next question is from Vaidehi Shripat Pisu. Uh, what is the role of toxicology in everyday life? Kindly guide for the richer areas in toxicology. Oh, that's fantastic. I think I think uh, if you get up in the morning, the first thing you do, uh, perhaps the you know you brush your teeth. So even the toothpaste uh, has to be looked for its safety and toxicity. Anything that you use in, in common day you know, during the daytime has gone through the portals of toxicology. <clears throat> it is the science that, as I mentioned to you, ensures safety of products uh, that come to the market. And so therefore, it, it has a huge role to play as far as, uh, uh, you know, safety of humans is concerned. Um, you also have occupational toxicology where you look at the various occupational settings. In various companies, you look at how it is, uh, if at all, it is harming the human being, then we tend to then provide corrective measures to them. And then, of course, guidelines come into play and, and that's how it grows. As far as the futuristic uh, uh, sort of areas are concerned, one thing, of course, we are looking at is how we can reduce the use of animals in toxicology. So we are looking at how to print 3D uh sort of organs on which we can do testing or for example can we have uh, chips that on which we can do testing or or understand the mechanism so i think we're trying to see uh, and it, in particular if you talk of areas i think uh, uh, the nanotoxicology has a great future uh, we are also looking at uh, the uh, sort of omics as as uh, the future of Toxicology, and as we are moving ahead uh, in in the in the newer areas uh, in chemical sciences and in material sciences, we are also looking at how to address or how to find uh, methods to be able to address these challenges where we are talking of very uh, minute quantities of the materials in, let's say, water or in uh, in humans, where we need to test so is it possible that we can have uh, sensors or devices that can test for you and you don't at the point of care and you don't need to sort of go out there so i think we are also trying as an institution to work in those domains which are very highly interdisciplinary and try to develop uh, some of these uh, devices that can that can check the contaminants uh, for you as a handheld device or a wearable device or whichever that's that's the future. I think that's where we are headed to. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so the next question is from Mohit Mehta. He's asking, uh, can education play any role to maximize the number of intellectual property? If yes, what kind of change do you think as a student I should do in study? Fantastic. I think. Uh, um, I, I must compliment. Uh, what was his name again? Mehta, some Mehta. Mohit, Mohit Mehta. So I must compliment Mohit for bringing this point up. Uh, I, for one, have been always saying that the education system needs to be changed. We need to ensure that the students start thinking rather than just learning what they are taught. Uh, once they start thinking, they will start understanding. Once they start understanding, they can innovate. So I think even now. Um, uh, since Mohit is uh, perhaps done his uh, undergraduation, that's how he is there part of this program. You should try to uh, see uh, any phenomenon and try to think why it is happening. Try to understand what why it is happening. Only then you'll be able to uh, take up new challenges. Only then you'll be able to innovate. So for innovation, you should understand the basic principles. You should understand uh, the. Uh, um, each and every step uh, in that process and I think that will be very enlightening and that's what we feel that in our education system experiential learning is very important rather than just by books so I think this is what the, the government of the day is also trying to foster to ensure that the students get an opportunity to learn right from school levels you have utter uh, tinkering labs now in school uh, you have other uh, sort of such programs that are there in colleges and universities and so uh, 
I think uh, uh, the fact that you started thinking in that direction uh, already shows your interest in innovation and don't let it die out. Be creative and start, you know, find out your place where you want to work and just go ahead. Thank you, sir. So the next question is from uh, Dr. Meera Parmekar. Uh, she is asking, are the facilities at IITR open for other researchers across country? If so, how can we approach the nanotoxicity department if we want our samples to be tested? Yeah, so uh, the first first thing when you say whether they're open, 100%, it's a big yes. Um, everything is available online. You can actually uh, book online as well. Um, other than that, you can write to us through the website and we'll be happy to uh, respond to you and see how we can help you in testing your uh, samples. We'll also guide you uh, in case you have to come all the way to us. If you are uh, placed somewhere else in this country, there are other facilities which can help you out as well. But it will be a pleasure to help in any way possible um, as, as far as the institute is concerned. Uh, so the next question is from Ambaris uh, Raj Deka. He's asking, is there any possible solution to the environmental protection, uh, environmental problem to replace traditional plastics with bioplastics uh, reinforced with nanoparticles. Yes, so uh, let's, let's not put nanoparticles in everything, but I'm saying that uh, people are already working again for bioplastics. People are using different kind of material um, since several years, including cornstarch, uh, which are biodegradable plastics to, uh, to a large extent. And uh, I think that work is going on in a big way. And perhaps you'll, you'll also in CSR and perhaps you'll see success uh, as we move forward. Uh, thank you, sir. Can we ask some more questions? Actually, sir, there are a lot of questions, so. Up to you. I can't say okay. no being the host, I can't say no. Okay. Yes, sir, we have one, one consolidated question. Okay. okay, one final sir? question. Okay, okay, sir. Okay, sir. One final question. Okay, sir. So the last question is from uh, Madhupriya Silveras. How the cancer cell is formed in the human body, uh, which food mainly causes the cancer? Can we modify the DNA to remove the cancer cells completely or by using xenotoxicity to remove cancer cells? Wow, that's the entire cancer biology into one question. So let me just say uh, from from the other side, the easiest thing that I can perhaps take on <clears throat> because the other things will take another lecture to explain how the cancer cell is formed. Uh, I mean, there are mechanisms in, in place where the DNA gets damaged and, and uh, you know, the, the programming of the cell uh, goes bad and it, it starts replicating. That is one. Um, or starts differentiating without uh, stopping, so that is one. But on the other side, I think in terms of food, <clears throat> people have shown that not only uh, this polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons is there, there in food. Uh, at some point in time, when you grill over grill things, uh, especially non-vegetarian food, there are certain carcinogens that go into your food. Thirdly, I think uh, what people say is that. Uh, when you talk of water, you should be careful. There are certain pesticides that are there. Smoking, of course, tobacco and smoking is another thing which is always highlighted on the um, on the internet or on your uh, social media, on television, that smoking kills uh, because of cancer and so does tobacco, <clears throat> chewing tobacco. So I think uh, uh, as long as we have good quality, uh, enough of antioxidants, I think we are good to go. Vegetarian diet, I'm not uh, for once saying that don't eat non-vegetarian food, but at the same time, you should also have uh, uh, large amounts of vegetables so that it controls the uh, oxidative mechanisms that are taking place and, and these antioxidants help you in a big way. So I think that is where I'll stop. And uh, But I think it's, it's a good question that the fact that she has got these thought processes is good. But perhaps uh, on another day we can discuss at length on cancer biology.
Sir, our students have uh, prepared the slide based on your talk. So they just want to share it now. So you can have a look. Sure. Well, that's wonderful. They redefined CSIR. All right. Great. Fantastic. So this is something that I've been enjoying. These students are very creative, very innovative. That by the end of the lecture, they already have the crux of the lecture. Yeah. Fantastic. They are next generation much smarter than our generation. Yeah, for sure, for sure. They think very quickly and they act even more quicker. That's that's quick. That's, that's really good. Thank you very much. This, whoever has done it, uh, my compliments to you. Yeah, yeah. Our yeah, student yeah. Lisa yeah. and uh, Monty yeah. and Rajiv, they Great have job. done it. And Lisa. So thank you very much, okay. sir. Now uh, I request uh, Monty, Miss Monty Gogoi, to offer <laughs> vote of thanks. Thank you so much, sir, for your very informative, innovative talk. Uh, we got a lot of appreciation comments for your talk, sir, and we would like to hear more from you, sir. Uh, I would also thank our Sastri, sir, who gave us the opportunity to prepare the slide for you and also to be a part of this program. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Monty. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Sasti, thank you so much. And I um, see you tomorrow then. And uh, we thank all the participants also for joining us for this uh, talk. And some of uh, the participants are joining through YouTube as well as Facebook Live. So uh, with this, we end our this uh, eminent scientist lecture. Thank you. Th thanks a lot, Jai Hind. Thank you, Jai Hind. Sir, Sastri, sir, sir, would you like to say something? No, I am very much happy and delighted to have this lecture. And whatever has to be said has been said. The redefinition that uh, Professor Alok Thawar always tried to give it to CSIR has been very clearly portrayed. And let us work towards that. Let's make uh, ideas are important and execution is more important and we will resolve with uh, much more dedication that we will work towards the glory of our country in this COVID times. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Alok. Thank, thank, thank you. Bye bye.